The title of the talk is The Beauty of Islam and uh, I'll begin with a hadith or saying of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, Verily God is beautiful and he loves beauty. If you ask me who my God is on whose name I call If you ask me who my God is He's the God of us all Allah the Merciful If you ask me what my book is That I hold in my hand If you ask me what my book is It's the Holy Quran The Holy Quran Today, no doubt we all agree that the world is engrossed in materialism of some sort or another. And we find people devoting most of their time and energies towards improving their environmental accommodation, their offices, the urban landscape, roads, and developing more and more the technical devices to make life more luxurious. Uh, and all this, we believe, is aesthetically improving our life and making things more beautiful. Today, of course, we know the TV has invaded every home and every life to such a point that people have actually almost lost the art of living and now we are watching people living our lives for us. The soapbox uh, syndrome is obviously evidence enough how people just love to watch other people getting on with their business of daily life. Now people's lives have become empty. Empty of etiquette, of manners, of courtesy, of purity. Most of these beautiful human qualities have all but disappeared. We understand from the Qur'an that the human being is God's masterpiece. Humanity was the last crown of God's creation on this earth. And man has been given, of course when I say man I am implying <laughs> man and woman, mankind generally human beings. Uh, and we have been given a status higher than the angels. And this is mentioned in the Quran. Inshallah, I'll read uh, that section. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وإذ قال ربك للملائكة إني جاعل في الأرض خليفة قالوا أتجعل فيها من يفسد فيها ويسفك الدماء ونحن نسبح بحمدك ونقدس لك قال إني أعلم ما لا تعلمون وعلم آدم الأسماء كلها ثم عرضهم على الملائكة فقال أنبئوني بأسماء هؤلاء إن كنتم صادقين 
قالوا سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم قال يا آدم أنبئهم بأسمائهم فلما أنبئهم بأسمائهم قال ألم أقل لكم من يعلم الغيب السماوات والأرض وَأَعْلَمُوا مَا تُبْدُونَ وَمَا كُنْتُمْ تَكْتُمُونَ Sadaq al The meaning or the basic interpretation of the meaning of these words When your Lord said to the angels I am placing on the earth one that shall be my deputy. They replied, Will you put there one that will do evil and shed blood? When we have for so long sung your praises and sanctified your name, he, God, said, I know what you do not know. He taught Adam the names of all things and then set them before the angels, saying, Tell me the names of these, if what you say be true. Glory to you, they replied. We have no knowledge except that which you have given us. You alone are wise, knowing. Then he said to Adam, Tell them their names. And when Adam had named them, he said, Did I not tell you that I know the secrets of the heavens and the earth, and all that you reveal, and all that you hide? Then the angels were commanded to prostrate. And then we said to the angels, prostrate yourselves before Adam. So this was a symbol of the honor and the status of man. So what was the purpose of man that is so noble? Was it just simply to give him a brain and then to watch him grow and age and die? Is this the noble purpose? Of course man has a much more noble purpose than that. The angels somehow, mystically, knew that it was part of man's nature to be able to commit excess, to make evil, to do corruption. and to shed blood. But God's knowledge extended far beyond that. So there was something about man so special. Again in the Quran it says in Surat al-Isra wal Mi'raj. We have bestowed blessings on Adam's children and carried them by land and sea, and we have provided them with good things and exalted them above many of our creatures. One of the most precious qualities of man is good behavior. The ability, for instance, to respond to evil with goodness. As it says in the Quran, repel evil with that which is better. And he between whom and thou was enmity will become as if thy warmest 
companion or intimate. To bear mis misfortune with faith and patience is part of the excellence of being human. Sabran Jamilan, as it says in the Quran, beautiful patience. In the chapter in the Quran called Joseph, Surat Yusuf, in fact this was the chapter which opened my heart to Islam when I was reading the Quran back in 1976. Of course I was already overwhelmed with the Quranic message anyway, but this chapter in particular, when I read it, it stopped me. Actually, it's called in the Quran, the best of stories. And it deals with two basic characteristics of Yusuf, of Joseph, alayhi salam, the Prophet Joseph. The whole surah can be, if you like, in essence, described as patience and piety. We should all, of course, know the story of Yusuf, how his jealous brothers tried to do away with him because his father loved him so much. And they tried to throw him down a well to get rid of him. Then we know that he was picked up by a caravan and the people then took him to the market and then sold him as a slave. We know that he was then taken and bought by a very noble family and then the wife of the lord of that house tempted him, but he resisted. Then we know that he was thrown into prison, how he suffered so many years. Finally he was released because he had interpreted the dream of the king of Egypt and had explained what it meant. Then he was released, vindicated, then he was given one of the highest positions as treasurer, minister of the treasury of wheat and grain, etc. We know then that his brothers came to ask for their provisions and he didn't reveal who he was. And then he arranged that a cup would be stolen and it would appear as if the youngest son, in fact his brother, Benjamin, uh, would be accused. Then he kept Benjamin and the sons went back to the father and now they had to explain the loss of another son. And when they came back with this story, Then Jacob understood, it seems, this aspect of man, so beautiful. He said, alas for Yusuf. He didn't despair. He said, I complain only to Allah. I take my complaint to God of my sorrow and my sadness. I know from Allah what you do not know, he told his sons. Go and seek news of Yusuf and his brother. And do not despair of Allah's mercy. None but the unbelievers despair of Allah's mercy. Look at what confidence and faith Jacob had. He didn't despair. He overcame that situation with patience and faith. Then he told his sons to go back 
And then when the brothers returned, Yusuf, who had, was now able to disclose his identity. And of course, the brothers repented. But that, then again, the reaction of Yusuf salam, he forgave them. After all that, that his brothers had done to him, and now after having the ability to crush them, he simply forgave them. And then he invited his father and his family to Egypt, where they lived prosperous and happy life. So many books and commentaries have been written about the beauty of Joseph. But it was mostly his character which was the most endearing and which immortalized his loveliness. So today, where is this kind of character and piety? What we find, unfortunately, there is an enormous gap in the knowledge of mankind, of modern man. A gross ignorance about Islam. And that gross ignorance is a result of the lack of knowledge about the last messenger of God, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The seal of the prophets, the last of the prophets, sent to guide mankind, created on the best of molds, as an example. But how many people today have even the slightest knowledge of his character and his life? And in the Quran it said, indeed you have been created with the greatest nature. Even Muslims, and this is one of the accusations we have to make, ignore to a great extent the behavior, the behavior of the Prophet, peace be upon him, and his teachings. Which is why we do not see much of Islam in evidence. His nature, his behavior, in Islamic terminology, is called the Sunnah. It doesn't, by the way, only, it's not just restricted to having a long beard or long robes. This is not, you know, we're not trying to classify it as only those external matters. We're talking about the character of the Prophet, peace be upon him. And this is really what's missing. One of the first things you learn in Islam is cleanliness. Today, everything appears to be clean. But if we go a little bit behind the surface, we find people are still ignorant of how to clean their own bodies, how to wash themselves properly. Health and hygiene, the Prophet, peace be upon him, taught that you cannot pray unless you have performed wudu, the ablution. And this ablution, a Muslim, a believer, should try to be in ablution all the time. To be clean. His clothes should not be soiled. Inshallah, we'll read some sections of this book, which is a very nice book, called The Etiquettes of Life in Islam. And this deals with some of the aspects of etiquettes in Islam. We'll begin with this aspect of cleanliness. 
And the Prophet Sallallahu said, the emblem of my ummah, meaning my nation, those who follow me, on the day of judgment will be that their foreheads and other parts of the body on which ablution is performed will be radiant with light. Hence, whosoever wishes to enhance his light is free to do so. Encouraging, therefore, to wash and clean yourself as much as possible. We know that the Prophet, peace be upon him, disliked foul smells. And in, in fact, it's forbidden to go to the mosque or to, or to have eaten something foul, uh, well, even harsh, like onions, and disturb the tranquility of the mosque by this smell. So he never used to eat those kind of things, such as onions or garlic. Yet we know today that the Muslim world, <laughs> if there's anything that distinguishes the Arabic cuisine, it's, you know, it's those kind of garlicky and curry type uh, smells. Not to say that we can't eat what we want, but I'm just giving an idea. At least we shouldn't take that into the mosque so that it shouldn't disturb us. What about smoking, for instance? Now people are beginning to wake up. Now people are beginning to go for those non-smoking areas. Now people are beginning to realize what a disturbance it is. He also encouraged the brushing of the teeth. This is a long time before any dental uh, knowledge or institutions and he used to order Muslims to brush their teeth saying I would have decreed, I would have made it obligatory to brush your teeth with a miswak means that there was toothbrush in those days the wooden which you still find of course today I would have decreed the brushing of teeth with miswak during all ablutions but for the inconvenience it would have caused my ummah. In other words, just not to make it so difficult because perhaps it would be impossible sometimes for someone to do that. So it was the mercy of the Prophet, peace be upon him, to say that it is not obligatory but it, I would have decreed if it was not so difficult. Also, a basic etiquette, for instance, covering your face with a handkerchief when you sneeze. The Prophet, peace be upon him, encouraged that when you sneeze, cover your face with a handkerchief. So that the excretion of this does not splash onto anybody else. And after sneezing, you should say, Alhamdulillah, praise be to Allah. And some say that, that, that we say, Alhamdulillah, praise be to Allah, after we sneeze, because after Adam was created, after life was breathed into him, the first thing he did was sneeze. And then he said, Alhamdulillah. He praised Allah. Etiquettes of dress. And it says in the Quran, Audu Billahi Mina Shaitan al Rajim. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا بني آدم قد أنزلنا عليكم لباسا 
لباسا يواري سوآتكم وريشا O children of Adam, we have provided you with raiments to conceal your shame and to serve as a protection and a decoration. And actually the word rish in this verse literally means the wings of a bird, which of course is so beautiful. So Allah is commanding us to dress, to cover our shame as a means of protection and as a beauty. Unfortunately, most people today are simply content with undressing as a form of fashion. And this, <laughs> to them, is a sign of progress. Whereas we see it as a, as a sign of degression. Moving away from the Adamic model of perfection because when he was sent to this earth, he was commanded to cover himself. And Eve, of course. But now we think that we're moving towards progression. Also, Abu Sa'id Khudri reports that whenever the Prophet ﷺ used to put on a new garment, he used to recite the following prayer. O God, unto thee belongs all praise, even thou even as thou hast clothed me in this garment, I ask of thee the good thereof, and the good of what, of that wherefore it has been made. And I seek refuge in thee from the evil thereof, and the evil of that wherefore it hath been made. Also, Umar an, stated that the Prophet وسلم, observed whoever puts on a new dress or new clothes and has the means should give away his old clothes to the poor. How many of us start to gather these clothes and start to collect them as items of memorabilia? And how often do we think of the poor people who don't have even the basics? And I think there's another saying that there are three basic rights for the human being, which is food, clothing, and shelter. The rights of every son of Adam. Also prayer. Prayer is one of the most beautiful expressions of faith and belief for the human being. A man who doesn't, or a person who doesn't pray, he has lost his humanity. Because it says in the Quran, We didn't create human beings except to worship. In other words, to serve God is the primary duty of the human being. And how to do that is to behave in the way that he has commanded us, that is worship. clean ourselves in the way that he has commanded us is worship. To eat in the way he has commanded us is worship. 
To marry is worship. To work is worship. Every aspect of life can be considered an act of worship provided it's done in the way that God has commanded and has guided us towards. But prayer is obligatory. As much as we have to eat to maintain our body, our bodily functions, we have to pray to maintain our faith. And I think there's another saying that the line between faith and disbelief is the prayer. This is a sign of a person's faith. And so prayer itself is one of the most beautiful expressions of that faith. And of course in Islam there are different kinds of prayer. We're talking about the prayer which the Prophet showed us, the five daily prayers in which we stand, we recite the Quran, we bow, we prostrate. And this is in, also in the Quran, it's mentioned, O oh, children of Adam, adorn yourselves properly at each hour of prayer. In other words, don't come uh, uh, in such a mood or in such a dress that makes you unmindful of the importance of this occasion. Come dress properly. Comb your hair. Prepare yourself. You're about to meet your Lord. What would you do if you're going to meet the Queen or someone equally, I suppose, if you consider her important, but <laughs> uh, yes, you would dress. So what about the Lord of the Universe? How should you behave? So, O oh children of Adam, adorn yourselves properly at each hour of prayer. Also, if you go, as we do, if, as we should, to the Fajr prayer, the dawn prayer, which is a very difficult prayer, it said. Very difficult prayer for the hypocrites. They may be able to do the other prayers, but the dawn prayer is very difficult <laughs> for the hypocrites. And no one can deny it's difficult, but it is difficult. So, when you set out, there's a dua, a prayer, there's another kind of prayer which I mentioned, there's different prayers. The one which we ask Allah for something, supplication. So this supplication is made, or should be made, on your way to the prayer in the morning, at Fajr, at dawn. Allahumma ja'al fi qalbi nooran wa fi basari nooran wa fi sam'i nooran wa an, wa an yameeni nooran wa an shimali nooran wa min khalfi nooran wa min amami nooran wa ja'al li nooran wa fi asabi nooran wa fi lahmi nooran wa fi dammi nooran wa fi sha'ri nooran وفي لساني نورا وجعل في نفسي نورا وأعظمني وأعظم لي نورا وجعلني نورا وجعل من فوق نورا ومن تحت نورا اللهم أعطني نورا O oh God 
Make light in my heart. Make light in my eyes. Make light in my ears. Light on my right, light on my left. Light above me, light beneath me. Light before me, light behind me. And make thou for me light. Light in my tongue, light in my sinews. Light in my flesh, light in my blood. Light in my hair, light in my body. Light in my soul. And magnify for me light. O oh God, bestow on me light. What a prayer and condition to begin the day with. Also, the recitation of the Quran itself. This is a form of worship. And we have been commanded by the Prophet, peace be upon him, to recite the Quran in a beautiful way. And I think there's even a hadith which says, he is not of us who does not, you know, beautify the Quran with his voice. So beautification is also achieved by the recitation of God's book. And there is a hadith, the best form of worship for my followers is the recitation of Quran. Inshallah, I'll read this hadith also. When the Prophet ﷺ said, God has ordained that any man who engages himself in the recitation of Quran so constantly that he finds no time to send prayers to me, I shall provide him with more without asking than those who ask. Also, the servant becomes nearer to God by means of recitation of the Qur'an. Also, the man who has studied the Qur'an and recites it daily can be likened to a basket full of musk, whose sweet smell is making the whole atmosphere fragrant. And the man who has studied the Qur'an but does not recite it may be likened to a bottle full of musk whose mouth has been sealed. Coming on to the subject of behavior and relationships. One of the first relationships we must be cautious and be careful about after our relationship with our Creator is our parents. And we'll find this in the Quran in many places. After the command to worship God, not to make partners with Him, comes the command to behave well with your parents. And in the Quran, in Surah Luqman, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitanir Rajeem Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. وَوَصَّيْنَا الْإِنسَانَ بِوَالِدَيْهِ هَمَلَتْهُ أُمُّهُ وَهْنًا عَلَى وَهْنًا وَفِسَالُهُ فِي عَمَيْنِ أَنْ اشْكُرْ لِي وَلِوَالِدَيْكَ إِلَيَّ الْمَصِيرِ وَإِنْ جَاهَدَاكَ عَلَى أَنْ تُشْرِكَ بِمَا لَيْسَ لَكَ بِهِ إِلْمٌ فَلَا تُطِعْهُمَا وَصَاحِبْهُمَا فِي الدُّنْيَا مَعْرُوفًا وَاتَّبِعْ سَبِيلَ مَنْ أَنَابَ إِلَيْهِ ثُمَّ إِلَيَّ مَرْجِعُكُمْ فَأُنَبِّئُكُمْ بِمَا كُنْتُمْ تَعْمَلُونَ This is the advice of Luqman to his son.
chapter 31. And we enjoined man to show kindness to his parents. For weakness after weakness his mother bears him, and he is not weaned before he is two years of age. We said, Give thanks to me and to your parents. To me shall all things return. But if they press you to associate with me what you have nothing of, which you know nothing of, do not obey them, but be kind to them in this world, and follow the path of those who turn to me. To me you shall all return, and I will declare to you all that you have done. So the only time you cannot obey your parents is when they are compelling you to worship other than Allah, or to disobey Allah. This is the time only that you could say no. As it says in another saying, there is no obedience to a creature when it involves disobedience to the Creator. And we know when a man came to the Prophet, peace be upon him, and said, who should I give my companionship to most? Who should I respect the most? He said, your mother. Then he said, who next? He said, your mother. He then said, who next? He said, your mother. Three times emphasizing the nobility and honor of the mother. What about marriage? Something which again is becoming unfashionable. We know that before the passing away of the Prophet وسلم, he made Hajj, pilgrimage. And during this pilgrimage, he gave a sermon, the last sermon. And part of this sermon is concerned with marriage. He said, O oh man, you have rights over your wives, and they have rights over you. It is your right that they do not fraternize with anyone of whom you do not approve, and that they do not commit adultery. But if they do, Allah has permitted you to isolate them within their homes and chastise them without cruelty. But if they abide by your rights, then they have the right to be fed and clothed in kindness. Do treat your women well and be kind to them, for they are the, your partners and committed helpers. You have taken them only as a trust from Allah, and you have their enjoyment only by His permission. So listen to me in earnest, O people, and reason well. I leave behind me two things, the Qur'an and my example. If you follow them, you will not go astray. And in another hadith, the Prophet ﷺ has affirmed, the believers who possess perfect faith are those who display the best manners, and the best among you are those who treat their wives in the best possible manner. That is the definition given by the Prophet ﷺ for the best of believers. And lastly, on the aspect of preaching. It says in the Quran, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Udu ila sabili rabbika bil hikmati wal mawidati il hasana. وَجَادِلْهُمْ بِالَّتِي هِيَ أَحْسَنٌ 
Call to the way of thy Lord with wisdom and beautiful preaching and reason with them in the best way. I hope, inshallah, we would have tried to have achieved some of that which we are commanded, inshallah, through the commands of Allah in the Quran and through the sayings of his Prophet And now, inshallah, we'll leave some time for questions and answers. Wassalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I think uh, the first side, you say it is not easy, but I think the best mm, dawah, if you like, that a Muslim can make is through his behavior. If he cannot behave well uh, and with proper etiquette, as I said, one of our problems was the fact that many Muslims have not really taken enough trouble in studying the etiquettes of life, uh, which would beautify his Islam, not just make him a rudimentary Muslim, or a fundamentalist, you may say. Yes, fundamentalism as far as faith is concerned, there's no doubt. But behavior must also be an ornament of our faith. And as the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that uh, I have been sent to perfect manners. So this would really endear many times, and has endeared many a non-Muslim to become interested in Islam and finally to embrace Islam because of the behavior of Muslims when they are applying Islam to their lives. So I think that that is one major way. And I think less and less preaching, in a way, uh, more and more actions. And I believe, connected to that, charity is not just uh, being concerned with your own Family, yes, of course, you get more reward by, first of all, if you have a, a poor relative, you look after them. But also charity must extend to all humanity. And that is the example of the Prophet ﷺ. Even once we know that um, uh, about during the time of the mission, uh, when uh, he once helped a lady, she had some baggage, and he helped her to carry this baggage. And she, all the way she was complaining about this man, Muhammad, saying he's brought trouble to our uh, tribe and to our religion and all that, and complaining about this man all the way through the journey. And then she said, you're so kind. Tell me, what's your name? He said, Muhammad. <laughs> so, you know, and then she said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashhadu an Muhammad al abduhu wa rasul. She accepted Islam because she saw the action without him even preaching. So, that is one aspect. Uh, as far as the freedom um, issue is concerned. I'm sorry, can you just repeat that? It crosses with the commitment. You want the oh, right, I know, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you're right, that when you get a group of uh, Muslims together, no doubt you will have occasion to find faults. Um, and, and actually, um, our problem is that the definition of what is a good Muslim needs to be reassessed because as we know it's not just a long beard certainly not it's not you know uh, those kind of things moderation is actually part of the beauty of Islam moderation ummatan wasatan the nation of the middle way that is actually the description of the Muslim ummah in the Quran so I think that is very important. And even we note in the sayings of the Prophet Wasallam that he encouraged towards moderation, but with basic belief, without hypocrisy, no doubt. But as far as uh, actions are concerned, when a man said, I want to give all my inheritance away, he said, you can't. He said, then let me give, you know, uh, two thirds, or he said, you can't. He says, one half, he said, you can't. One third, he said, okay, but that is still too much. You know, to give away one third in charity. So, again, a person wanted to fast all his life. He said, you mustn't. He said, if you wish to fast, then fast, you know, um, on Mondays and Thursdays. He said, I can do more than that. 
He said, then fast also the three white days, it means the full moon, the day before and the day after. Then he said, I can do more than that. He said, then do the fast of David, which is fasting one day and breaking the fast the next. Fasting next day, breaking the fast the next. And that, there is no better fast than that. So always, so that you feel the hunger, you would not continue to such a point in fasting that you become so used to it, you're not even fasting anymore. Moderation. So I think that that is another problem that we have to address and know the difference between what is laxity. This is a, recently there's been a, a, a lecture given by Sister Aisha Lemu, a British Muslim sister who lives in Nigeria. And the title of that lecture is Laxity, Moderation and Extremism. And I think we have to understand the definition of all these areas so that we can understand what a good Muslim is. Well, I think we've briefly touched on the social system of Islam. I mean, we haven't really touched on the political system of Islam or the economic system of Islam, apart from, well, I don't think we did touch on it at all. So, of course, the economic system of Islam, again, we were trying, because we were talking about the age of materialism and the fact that we're so much involved in materialism, again, the ba balance of Islam, we shouldn't go totally over to, to such an extent that we forget that we have to live, we have to work, we have to earn a living. Yes, it's good to be reminded that a Muslim uh, has to earn a living and it should be a halal living. And there are basic conditions and rules for the economic prosperity of the society. One of those basic rules, as we know, again in the last khutbah, emphasized abolition of usury. The abolition of usury of interest. One of the main cancers of any economic system is this thing called usury. person who hasn't got money in the first place needs to borrow and then he has to pay back not only that but what he doesn't have anyway which is more uh, than he uh, borrowed. So that, is been, that has been cursed in Islam. The person who gives it, the person who takes it, the person who writes it down. Also zakah which is one of the principles of Islam, which is the uh, welfare tax, you may call it, which is obligatory for every Muslim who has above a certain amount of wealth, which is calculated according to the weight of gold or silver, approximately 200 pounds or thereabouts uh, in today's terms, um, he must pray, pay zakat. And then he must give that zakat to those who deserve it, to those who are in need, those who are poor, the orphans, the wayfarers, those in debt to free the slaves, uh, for those whose hearts have to be reconciled, uh, the traveler, etc. Imagine if every Muslim, you know, were to truly pay the zakat which is due, including those countries, now we come to this political system, <laughs> uh, those countries which have been given uh, the blessing of oil and the blessing of, of, of natural resources, the percentage which is due on, on those materials is more than two and a half percent. Normally a Muslim should pay two and a half percent of his gold that he has or, or savings, money, cash. But for that which comes from the earth, there's a larger amount has to be paid. And I'm, forgive me if I'm, I'm not a scholar on this particular aspect, but it, it is much more than that, somewhere between 10% uh, and, 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 and above. Imagine if all this was recirculated as it should be. This is the meaning of currency. Money should be circulated, not kept back, not used just to build monolithic urban development schemes which never work and which nobody can live in, which is what we see a lot in certain countries. Uh, unfortunately, the politicians, those who are representing Muslim peoples of certain lands, have lost their uh, understanding of Islam, they have lost their ability to see the beauty of Islam, and they have started to follow the ways of 
error and misguidance. Now we see uh, Saudi Arabia actually in debt, which is unbelievable to imagine. So when you come onto the political system, that is of course another aspect, and there is no such thing as royalty in Islam. You remember when I referred to the Queen, <laughs> there was no uh, special honour, um, except you do treat people with the, according to their status, but knowing that everybody is equal, it is only um, taqwa which, or piety which makes a person better than another. Well, the sunnah, as I said uh, before, is the behavior of the Prophet, peace be upon him. He used to raise up at night for tahajjud prayer, night prayer. When everyone is sleeping or was sleeping, he used to raise up and make ablution and pray. Maybe even two-thirds of the night, maybe one-half of the night, one-third of the night before dawn. But this was not made obligatory. There are certain aspects of Sunnah. Abu Bakr Siddiq, who was the first caliph or successor to the Prophet used to pray with her. The three rakats with one odd uh, at the end before he went to sleep. And that means or indicates that perhaps he didn't do tahajjud. Or if he did, at least he didn't make it known. So that it wouldn't become a burden for those who couldn't do it. So the sunnah itself is very simple. And has been made very clear. And it is not a burden. And if it becomes a burden, even fasting, as we know, you are relieved of the duties of fasting if you are sick if you are traveling for sisters who are going through certain periods, if after the birth of a child, etc., etc., uh, even for the elderly. So therefore, um, this aspect of moderation is all, of course, within the guidance of the sunnah. That's what we mean. I discovered Islam after being given a copy of the Qur'an back in 1976 and up to that point I knew as much as any Westerner more or less about Islam. It was, you know, connected to some kind of image of nationalism, of Arab, Turk, backwardness, barbarity, <laughs> all these images uh, combined to, you know, form my concept of what I perceived to be Islam. Then I was given the Quran in 1976. That's when I started to realize that all these myths about Islam had nothing to do at all with this religion. That this religion was for mankind. It has nothing to do with nationalism. Rabbil Alameen, Lord of all beings. Uh, and therefore I became attuned to the message of Islam after reading and after about one year um, and as I said, Surat Yusuf, the chapter of Yusuf, Joseph in the Quran, was one of the major turning points in, in my life when, when reading. And then I embraced Islam in 1977. Yeah, this is the aspect which we were talking, our brother said, that when you get Muslims together, you'll find that one, one will always <laughs> have to correct the other. And alhamdulillah, I appreciate your uh, correction of my omission, perhaps, of the aspect of jihad. Of course, the meaning of jihad in Arabic means to struggle, to exert oneself to the utmost extent in the way of Allah, that is jihad. That can be also in any form. It can be fighting, it is fighting, it is writing, it is getting up for fajr, it is going into the mosque to seek knowledge. Um, jihad is wide. Uh, but we must remember, the jihad of Islam, the main objective, is to remove obstacles in the way of people's freedom to embrace the religion of Allah, Islam. 
if there is no obstacle to a person having knowledge and coming to Islam, the purpose of jihad is removed. So long as you're able to give the message, don't forget, jihad is mainly to protect the rights of people to hear the message of Islam, to know the message of Islam, to accept Islam, to embrace Islam, to practice Islam. So that's why I didn't include it centrally, because I felt that the main object was to convey Islam. Um, and uh, jihad is one of those aspects which, once there is an objection or an obstacle, uh, then it is the means to remove that obstacle so that people are free to worship their Lord. The Prophet وسلم, of course, established the perfect model of society in Medina. Uh, now today, it's, it's so difficult for Muslims because of the nature of society and uh, the world as it is. Uh, therefore, practicing Islam in the way that we believe we should be practicing Islam is very difficult, as it's indicated by the hadith that there will come a time when it will be so difficult to practice Islam as it will be to hold uh, a hot red coal in your hands. So, yes, um, it is difficult. That difficulty in itself is a jihad to overcome. Um, but we have in the example of the Prophet the widest of models. Before Medina was Mecca. So we can also glean from this that in certain circumstances, when the occasion is not, or the circumstances are, are not perfect, or to provide the Medinan model, then the minimum that must happen is that the people, or the Muslims, must be acting according to the basics of Islam, prayer, charity, fasting, and giving da'wah. Giving da'wah. And I think this is one of our missing elements. You know, da'wah, for those who don't understand the meaning, it means to call, to invite to God's religion. That is da'wah. So I think this is one of our main missing elements. If we find ourselves in a situation, da'wah is the, the means. Then if we find that there is difficulty, then there is possible jihad, or even it says in the Quran, <coughs> when, the pe when the people come on the Day of Judgment, and they'll be faced with a fire, uh, or in the words to this effect, if you may know the, ver the, the verse better, uh, and it says that the angels will claim their souls while they were wronging themselves, and they will be told, why are you in this condition? They said, we were weak in the land. And then the angels will say, wasn't God's earth wide enough for you? So even if it becomes that difficult, and you, maintain, and you stay in that place where you find it so difficult to practice your religion, surely this verse is what it means. You should move in some way to, there, to that place which you are able to practice. You know. So, I mean, this, uh, may Allah guide us, inshallah, Allah wa'ala. Life, of course, was, uh, I'll never forget that I used to dream and long for the time when I would be able to leave school and be free. You know, to be free. Freedom was the most precious of conditions and desires, as far as I was concerned. And money, the acquisition of money, also enabled one, or seemed to, uh, provide a person with more freedom to do more things that one wanted. Um, later, I became ill with tuberculosis, and I became, had to go into hospital and remain there for some months. Therefore, one of my freedoms was restricted, my body. Then I started to think, well, hold it. One day, 
I'm not going to have this body anyway. Right? With all that I could acquire in freedom and money, ultimately, I have to face the grave. What is beyond that? I was not satisfied. And I realized that there was a, another greater question, another greater freedom, which is the freedom of truth, knowledge of the truth. And that is where, you know, when a person starts to think and starts to seek the truth, they can never, never be at rest until you find it and accept it. And, I, and that's what happened, alhamdulillah, when I was given the Qur'an and I realized that this is the truth. It was only my obstinate nafs, my self, my self-conceit, which was stopping me from embracing the truth. Therefore, I put aside my self-conceit and alhamdulillah, embraced Islam by the grace of Allah. So, uh, one question. Uh, what would you say to young Muslims? Um, students who find Islam as a peripheral and, you know, irrelevant thing to their way of life, to, to everyday being, everyday life, how they go about things. What would be your comment to them and how would you uh, try and explain what Islam can do for them? I think I would say more or less what I said today. Just now. And I don't think I would... <laughs> I mean, you could say that the, the youth, of course, have a, a difficult time uh, because at a young age, you really do feel that you're going to live forever and you've got all the power, that you know, strength and your senses are at their height. You know, so the bodily experience or the physical experience, being young, really sometimes can be an obs ob obstacle to your seeing longer term uh, principles of important principles for living. And uh, you know, the, naturally, the wish to coexist with the opposite sex very, very strong at that age. Therefore, the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, whoever can, get married. So this is actually one of the best advices we can give to the young. Because that is, and however young, so long as they are of age, responsibility, and realize the responsibility of this, uh, marriage institution, then should get married. <laughs> Jazakallah. Now, uh, quite a controversial question. Uh, it's to do with Salman Rushdie. Put very simply, a God who can justify the murder of a human being because of something that he has written, the novel, uh, is not a God worthy of my belief. This was a comment. Could you make a comment on this and what your reaction be to that? It's hard to hold back my emotions at a time like that <laughs> when asked such a question. Uh, but uh, quite frankly, if uh, the person who writes that kind of question um, would understand that first of all, the death sentence in Islam on person who blasphemes or makes a mockery of religion or of the Prophet, peace be upon him. It is a deterrent, as much as the atom bomb is a deterrent. America wields its, you know, power and ability to nuke anybody, anywhere, anytime, to maintain its culture, its way of life. Surely, this is uh, abhorrent when we see that, uh, in fact, what they're talking about is the annihilation of peoples en masse through the development of this nuclear power en masse. Children, women, elderly, everybody. They are willing and they have used it. And in Iraq, we have seen the reckless bombing and killing of young and children. No word, it seems, spoken up at that time. But when one person comes and more or less nukes 
you know, nukes, the beliefs, <coughs> the precious beliefs of one billion, he's protected. He has to be killed for that? Uh, as I said, there's a deterrent. It's a deterrent. And the um, conclusion to this, if a person repents, and this is what we're talking about in Islam, there's always a way out. There should be a way out. And the way out in Islam is if a person does a mistake, he should repent. Uh, and that is Islam. If people understood the Bible more, they would see that Islam is not saying anything new. In the Old Testament, it mentions, for instance, something uh, with regard to Moses, when talking about the person who blasphemes, should be stoned. When Jesus uh, salam, is talking about the blasphemer, he said, he shall not be forgiven. And he said elsewhere that I have not come to remove any tittle or, or, or any aspect of the law. So he was confirming the law, Mosaic law, bringing uh, another aspect. Anyway, it's full of hypocrisy, the West's attitude, and I would say in particular many people's attitude towards this. They would be silent on many other issues. When we're talking about freedom, we're talking about the freedom of people, yes, to live and to write, to convey their ideas, etc., etc. But when those writings and ideas start to hurt and insult other people, even the Quran it says, do not revile their gods, even God of the universe, allowing people to worship statues. Saying, don't revile them in case they might revile Allah in return and that would cause their destruction. You must observe basic respect for people's rights of belief in Allah and if you look at the three first the Ten Commandments it says thou shalt not take any other God beside me Islam it says, thou shalt not make any graven image. And it says, thou shalt not take the name of thy Lord in vain. Christianity today has become so devalued because people have allowed their faith to be ridiculed, insulted. All sorts of insults have been hurled until they surrender and turn the other cheek. Islam is permanent. It cannot be changed. And if anybody breaks a law of Islam, of course, if he's in an Islamic state, he would face the Islamic punishment. Today, there's a war of propaganda going on against Iran. You should not be so foolish as to believe that the British people, the British government, are so concerned about one man's life, especially as he happens to be an Asian to begin with, Right? But they're concerned about the arrogance of Iran and its ability to wield the moral stick against this nation. And that is more politics than it is sense. Yes, I mean, after this uh, question, unfortunately, it, it is used now as, as a means of, again, we know the Orientalists, how hard then, especially in this building itself, I think, <laughs> to deter people from understanding Islam. And all you have to do is to ra raise this little flag, Rushdie, you know, around. And usually people say, ah, you see, it's logical, illogical. On the one hand, you're talking about mercy. On the other hand, you're talking about killing people. Well, the law is there. If the law is broken, there has to be uh, a solution. People go, you're not supposed to kill. Now, if a person kills, what do you do? So there is a deterrent in Islam. One of the aspects of Islamic law which is so important is the aspect of mercy. I read somewhere, by the way, recently, or sometime, that in Saudi Arabia there was this, there was going to be an execution. Somebody had killed another brother's wife and daughter. 
and he was about to be executed. Now, in Islam, there is the right of the person, the relation, to insist. Once the, the, the crime has been committed, and it's proved without any doubt, because any doubt would lift the, the uh, capital punishment. But if there's no doubt, then the relative has the right to, to ask for that, that person's uh, execution. And at this point, this man was about to be executed, and Allah, in the middle of this, just before, the man, the relative said, I forgive you for Allah. And then the man, the, the, the executioner stopped. I mean, this is Islam. Yes, you have the right to take the life. That's justice. It cannot be done. It shouldn't be done by the person himself. It should be done through the process of law. But ultimately, he has the right to forgive that person. And forgiveness and repentance is, very, is the center of our faith and belief. No man is innocent. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, every son of Adam makes mistakes, sins. The best is he who repents the most. Repentance is the key to the solution of our problems. And, you know, when we're talking about mercy, the capital punishment itself, if a person commits a crime and he is uh, punished, that punishment is a payment for that crime. So he would have no stigma on the Day of Judgment. It's a removal of that crime so that he can be forgiven. And I think even it says in the Bible, if people are studying the New Testament, it says something that, to the effect that if your right hand offends you, in other words, if it steals, cut it off, lest it burn forever with the body, in other words, in the hell fire of damnation. So therefore, system of punishments and law is a mercy in a way for the protection of the majority. It's the minority, the criminals who suffer. Now in England, in Britain, they're starting to think about considering more the victims. Again, they're coming round to that idea that, oh, perhaps we shouldn't forget. Those poor old ladies who have been battered, who have no, you know, protection. Yes, those violent criminals should be de de dealt with as criminals. Because sometimes there are some people who will not understand until they feel, you know, the strength of reaction against their crime and against their character. Islam comprehends all kinds of characters and people in society, but it, ba it, basis it basically establishes a norm for society where the ordinary citizen can live in peace, leave their doors open if necessary, as we find in some Muslim countries, alhamdulillah, that practice certain elements of Sharia. You can leave your money on the street and it'll stay there until you come back and collect it. And this is a, a blessing in the beauty of Islam. We have a quite important question here, uh, especially as we're living in the West. Non-Muslims generally view that the veil is an obstacle to freedom. What's your comment on that? The veil is a protection for the society. And it is a protection for the institution of marriage. I never forget when I was traveling all over the world, giving um, concerts, etc., etc. And I once uh, I went to a hotel, and this couple had just got married, and then they came out down to the pool, and both displaying themselves almost naked. Uh, and of course, people are going to look. People start to stare, lustfully, at what they see as these two, this handsome couple, almost naked. Really, what they're doing is destroying their marriage. Gradually, after a while, this kind of behavior, one will look at one's wife and say, well, she's not this good-looking as this other lady I'm seeing walking down the road. 
that kind of uh, stigma of looking with lust at the opposite sex has been curtailed and restricted in Islam. First, the male is supposed to lower his eyes. That's the first command. First, the male should lower his eyes. And if he glances, generally there's no harm. But he should not be looking um, lustfully. Now, how to protect if he does want to converse with a sister? She should be dressed modestly so that he can converse with her without falling into that trap of, you know, natural trap of longing to, 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 to you know, know the person better. So therefore, dress protects the Islamic way of life, it protects the marriage, fundamentally. And the lady can dress as she wishes, and she has every right, as it says in the khutbah, we said, to be dressed and clothed fed and clothed in kindness and the husband's supposed to give you know according to his wealth whatever the wife needs but that is for the family for the children to see the relatives uncles uh, cousin um, um, uh, sorry nephews nieces but not for those um, who are outside of that circle that protects the basic family and the respect and dignity of that family. Uh, and I believe that is one of the wisdoms uh, in Islam. And it, by the way, it creates freedom for the family to be, uh, in the end, it is freedom which is obtained. Freedom from uh, jealousy, from hasad, from envy, from divorce. And now we see what is the final result of this kind of way of life in the West, how many you know, I don't know what the statistics are, I'm sure you know better. Um, one in three or whatever, you know, uh, uh, divorce. There's the evidence. We have uh, one question here. It's to do with evolution. It's a general topic. How can I answer my daughter who asked me one day that man was created from, from an ape? Well, we were created by, created from Adam and Eve. What came first, the chicken or the egg? I think this is the, you know, the riddle. And first man was created, human being was created as a human being. It was no accident. And that is foolish, you know, for a person to imagine or to think or propose that um, the human being in all his wonderment and faculty was like the result of, a, of the bumping around of a few cells here or there in such perfect consequence meticulous mathematical uh, precision something that the chances of which would be billions and billions upon billions and billions and billions of <laughs> coincidences following one another I mean that to me is the mentality of a monkey I would say uh, but the, the question of the chicken and the egg so what came first they say the chicken or the egg well it would be logical to think that the egg came first because the egg pre sort of dates the chicken usually um, Chickens don't just start flying around. <laughs> they have to be, you know, as a result of the egg. But at the same time, we know that what can come out of a chicken could be an alligator. So who decided what was to come out of the egg? And what was destined was the chicken, not the egg. So in other words, as far as I'm concerned, Adam was created, uh, the father of all human beings, to be uh, the first human being, and God created him from dust. And that's in the Quran, and 
logic also would, would help us to understand. If this so-called idea of evolution, which by the way I think a lot of scientists have already discarded uh, a long time ago, but there's a basic echo of this uh, theory still hanging around. It's logical that from one comes two, even when you learn about biology and you learn amoeba, you know, the basic you know, entity or be created or to evolve and to be both having the same faculties as man, impossible. So we know for sure, even logic demands that we accept that there was one first man and first woman. Alhamdulillah. والله أعلم إن سألتم عن نبي فهو إنسان عظيم One Islam Productions, an Islamic film studio established in Australia, is dedicated to producing films for all Muslims. Just some of the films by One Islam Productions. Children's programs, Islam for Me, We Remember Allah, Storytime and more. Educational films, Pray As You Have and Seen Me Pray, to lead Words, pray. Ramadan, Renewal Next. of Faith. Documentaries. We at One Islam Productions believe that Islam is precious and deserves to be presented in only the highest quality. Visit us at www.oneislam.net for more information. One Islam Productions, a film production company run by Muslims for Muslims.